Okay, right, excellent. Um, okay, well, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to uh, present. Um, today's talk is going to be uh, a bit of a kind of introduction to a topic rather than necessarily any uh, specific research findings, at least predominantly. So, um, I suspect that most of you will know all this already, but I thought it'd be worth recapping what we mean by health inequalities and then trying to explain why I think micro simulation could be a really useful approach. So um, there's a classic definition um, that's often used. Um, so this particular summary version draws on a review of existing definitions of health inequalities. But the key points are when we're using the term health inequalities, we're thinking of things that are systematic, avoidable, and unfair differences in health outcomes across social groups. Um, and we can think of health inequalities as being between countries, but also within a given country or society. So for today, I'm going to focus more on within countries. Okay, so that's broadly speaking, the, the kind of focus of um, today's talk, but, but also I think a lot of what the school often works on as well. And importantly, uh, health inequalities can occur across multiple axes of, of inequality. So um, there's different aspects of socioeconomic position, um, but also things like gender, ethnicity, geography, uh, age, disability, etc. cetera. Um, and I, this is not a comprehensive list. This is a, uh, a kind of a short, indicative list just to give you a sense of when we're talking about health inequalities, we're talking about multiple th uh, axes of inequality, not just a single one. Uh, importantly as well, the impacts of health inequality can differ across uh, multiple axes of inequality. So we can think about, for example, the health experiences of a low income uh, black woman being different from the health of experiences of a low income uh, black man, for example. So the combinations of characteristics matters. So I'm not gonna labor this point, but there's lots of recommendations about how do we address health inequalities. Um, this is a, a more recent set of kind of principles, uh, but they generally always come up with a similar list. So importantly, there tends to be an emphasis on early years. There tends also to be a very strong emphasis on the social determinants of health. So often things that aren't being done by the health system, but uh, include things like employment, um, having enough income to uh, have a healthy life, et cetera. And so in addition to this focus on the social determinants, we also know that generally interventions that require individuals to take action tend to be less effective in reducing health inequalities than things that are more structural in their approach. So often the actions of uh, governments, including things like regulating uh, commercial actors and so forth, um, can be more impactful in reducing health inequalities than trying to encourage individuals to take action in some way, partly because uh, people's ability to take action is socially patterned. We also know that often those types of more structural approaches can be quite difficult to study through randomized trials. That's not to say that uh, more clinical interventions can't play a role in reducing health inequalities, but generally it's going to be uh, a much smaller part of a successful health inequality strategy than actions to address the social determinants. And effects can also differ across contexts. So the fact that something worked in the US, for example, is no guarantee that it would work in the UK. So even if you have randomized trials, you can't necessarily just apply them to, for example, the UK or Scottish context. 
So this ultimately leads us to think that we often need to implement policies to try and reduce health inequalities in a context of uncertainty. So we may not have evaluations or trials of particularly promising interventions. And that's almost by definition the case in many areas. So that takes us on to the, the argument I'm going to make today about policy modeling and in particular micro simulation. So um, what is policy modeling? So this is where we're trying to create, in effect, a simplified version of reality. And um, for today's purpose, I'm going to focus more on quantitative modeling, but sometimes people will do more qualitative approaches as well. Um, and it often involves bringing together real world epidemiological data alongside explicit, ideally causal assumptions, and then being able to project what might happen in the future and compare that under different intervention scenarios. So we can then run kind of what if scenarios for if we introduce this policy, what might happen, and importantly, what might happen in terms of health inequalities. Um, of course, as with all modeling, um, there's always assumptions underpinning these things, um, but we can try our best to explore those assumptions and check how robust our results uh, are to differing assumptions. Um, okay, and just to kind of give you a sense of why this type of approach might be useful and an illustration of how it's been useful in the past, if we think about quite a major policy in a Scottish context, minimum unit price of alcohol, um, there was a, a particular policy model that drove a lot of the interest in that policy. And um, it was often referred to as the single most, uh, single most often referred to piece of work. Um, and uh, people who were interviewed about this, including politicians, civil servants, et cetera, realize that this was an area where you can't just do a randomized trial and actually is a case for relying on these types of modeling approaches more. The other way of thinking about modeling is it may or may not be based on a single data set. So the simplest models often do just take a single data set and project them forward. But actually, often the questions that are of most interest to policymakers are not uh, the kinds of things that there's a single data set to address. So you may well want to bring together different sources of evidence. So that could be, for example, a, a systematic drawing on a systematic review that focuses on the same exposure outcome relationship, but it could also be looking at different types of evidence that strengthen your understanding of is a relationship causal, um, and also different bodies of evidence, which might be, are there uh, a different aspect of an issue? So for example, how common um, something is, how effective the treatment is, and what the typical kind of natural history or prognosis might be. So you might be drawing on all these uh, bits of evidence to answer different types of questions and try to integrate them all into a model. So, uh, what about micro simulation in particular? So this is where we try and model individuals rather than groups of people. And the point of that is it allows you to look at lots of aspects of health inequalities, as well as intersections across axes of inequality. Um, we can look at what happens over time, and we can look at time in terms of discrete time intervals. So like, for example, annual intervals, or continuous time, uh, but you need quite rich data to parameterize these types of models, and they can be quite intensive computation. So here's a, a little simplistic illustration. Um, now, obviously, a real model would be more complex than this, but this is just to kind of give you a, a heuristic idea of what it might look like. So we can imagine we've got a person with I, different ID numbers, and we're projecting them into the future uh, on yearly time increments. And they might have a different age, sex, SMD, different ethnic groups, and they might have high blood, hypertension, cholesterol, smoking, and then they might experience a heart attack and they might die. 
Okay, so we might have some baseline data and then we need to project that forward. So we then try and predict what might happen to each individual for the next year and then kind of going forward again. So some of the things we can kind of assume, uh, and obviously the, uh, we, we might just project the age as being plus one and we could just treat that deterministically. Whereas other things we might need to have, for example, some kind of statistical model that estimates what's the most likely outcome. And we try and make it random in terms of each run, you would get different results. So there's a kind of stochastic element. And you can see here, for example, the first individual, over time, they go forward, they might develop high blood pressure, um, but they remain alive throughout, whereas the second person um, has a heart attack in uh, year one and then dies in year two. Okay, so just to finish off, um, a quick case study. So we were interested in understanding the impacts of universal basic income. So this is quite a radical policy to give um, everyone in society an unconditional regular cash payment. Um, and it's, there have been several attempts to try to pilot it, but it's never quite been piloted in this way in the high income country. So it's the kind of thing that is quite well suited to modeling. And we looked at three different approaches. So we tried to model what was called a partial UBI, where everyone gets the same amount of money as existing benefits, a full UBI, which is giving people enough money to actually live a healthy life, and what we call the full plus UBI, which is realizing that some people, the standard amounts of money for a healthy life may not be enough. So you might need to actually have a, a higher level for those people. And we run it through a, a micro simulation model that has a set of different modules. And what happens is people cycle through all these things and then on a yearly basis. So they might change their education level, change their health, change uh, their household composition, etc. And all of those things then influence their health. So what did we actually find? Well, so all forms of UBI uh, radically reduced income inequality um, with the full and full plus effectively eradicating poverty. Um, but the effects depended in terms of health very much on what would happen to people's employment. So there are debates about whether people would stop working if you give them money or would they carry on working. And we model what might happen under both of those scenarios. And you can see that there would potentially be uh, a slight improvement in mental health in this situation, uh, or a deterioration in mental health, depending on what those employment effects were. Uh, but actually, in terms of the expense of this type of policy, it would be a very, very expensive way of uh, achieving at least th these health impacts. Okay, so I think that's everything. So just thank my funders, and I'll stop there. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, it's the first time I really got the traction to this. It's great. And um, I'm wondering about the way you model these different variables in the future. It's kind of, I think, a Bayesian way you have different surfaces and what different variables, like Asian variables, as you said, for sure there's one for a year while. I think that's got some evidence of the design surface levels for all kinds of history. Yeah, so um, there's no kind of single way of doing it. Um, so different models will use slightly different approaches. Some might be Bayesian. Um, a lot, it's probably more common to be frequentist, but still incorporate the uncertainty. So for example, you can use a standard regression model and then just do a kind of uh, prediction afterwards uh, based on the kind of covariance you've got in the model. And you can sample from the uh the the kind of distribution of predicted values if you see what I mean um so to get your uncertainty kind of within the model uh so, so that's probably the the most standard way of doing it thank you very much for your presentation
Okay, that's a stupid question, which is, you know, how do you know it's right? Um, <laughs> in the sense of, you know, kind of, what kind of threshold do you use? So, so example, yeah. UBI and like, employment, my understanding of that is that the studies that have looked at that, you know, the evidence is a bit mixed and what have you. So do you have a certain exactly. level of a kind of threshold whereby you say, right, well, we use that evidence in the model, not use other evidence. How, how, how do you apply that? Yeah, so I think there's, um, so the whole thing about how certain can you be in the model is, uh, and the validation process, that's probably actually the most time consuming bit. So actually that's where a lot of the work is, is around kind of validation of models. Um, the, there are simple things you can do. So you can try and see, okay, how well do we predict what's happened in the past, for example? Um, and, and so when we do that for our own modeling, generally it seems to be okay. Uh, but when you're talking about something like a UBI, you actually, we've got no real guide of what its impacts, whether the effects we observe in the past would still hold in the future. So in that kind of situation, that's where actually presenting alternative results under different assumptions becomes quite important. So that's why we have kind of different you know the what would the results be like if we assume this and if we assume that um a lot ideally you would want to work with um kind of policy makers and other people who might have views on what would be a reasonable set of scenarios to look at and so forth um so yeah i, th I think those are probably the, the the key things you can also uh check what the results would be if you changed more um, so things like parameters are very easy to change. And so we, we do do that, for that. So for example, if the effects of uh, unemployment were different and differed by this amount, we can try that out in the model. Um, there are also kind of more structural uncertainties, which uh, are often more difficult to incorporate, but we, um, and, and, and that's one of the, the challenges. So we could try and address that, but that, that's a bit more difficult. Patel, we've got an online question, if that's all right. Um, yep, Josephine, Josephine Adekola asked if you could expand a little bit on the effectiveness of structural versus individual-based approaches to health inequalities, or should we be pursuing a dual approach? Yes, uh, so, so, so th this is uh, this is something that's, that, that's hugely debated. So there's... Um, In terms of what is what the evidence suggests is likely to have the biggest uh, lead to the biggest impacts in terms of health inequalities, the more structural it is certainly the more promising. Uh, the difficulty is it's also probably the more difficult to implement um, kind of politically and uh, and for other reasons as well. Um, so I think. For that reason, there probably is still a role for more actions that that, uh, that focus on the individual. That said, um, I'm not sure if we've quite got the balance right in terms of where a lot of the effort within public health lies. So I think we probably do still err uh, too much on um, focusing on individual level interventions rather than structural interventions. Does that kind of address the question, Johnny? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks. I have a quick question. Um, so you mentioned you could use qualitative data. How would you go about doing that? Um, so, so there's two things. So there's using qualitative data to inform the modeling. So for example, um, one of the things we've been doing is uh, looking at the kinds of scenarios that people might be interested in modeling. Um, so you might well work with, for example, policymakers or the public or um, to, to try and understand uh, the scenarios to model, but also the kinds of outcomes that are important to people, for example. Um, but then separate from that, there are also uh, 
it might also influence what kinds of assumptions you make in your modeling. So for example, um, a lot of our modeling kind of focuses on income and employment as key pathways, whereas um, it could be that actually uh, it, it's less about kind of employment and more about, say, contract security or something like that, or some other aspect of work. And so that might then change our approach. Um, there are also qualitative modeling approaches as well as distinct from the kind of stuff that I've been presenting. So not micro simulation, but more um, actually uh, approaches that are inherently more qualitative in nature. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We have a little thing to. Um, it's okay. Don't oh, worry. I know. <laughs> no worry. Don't worry. Just read these slides. Okay, cool. Great. Good. Last but not least, how are you all doing? Dying? Needing lunch? Yeah, me too. Um, so uh, first of all, before I continue to say anything, uh, my name's Tara and I come with a disclaimer. I'm a very passionate speaker. Part of this is cultural. So I'm from Malta. We just talk loudly. But the other part is personality. This is who I am. I'm very passionate, enthusiastic. I have a Springer Spaniel and you know how they say owners are like their dogs. Like I'm just always like, oh, get a scent and I'm excited. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. And thank you for being here. I all know that you have so many things that you would much rather be doing. So my goal with this talk is to give you insight into what I do as a researcher. So that when you see me walking around the building, you're like, oh, that's Cara, isn't she the complexity person? Um, but the other thing was to give you insight into the PhD that I'm going to be starting in a little while. So this talk isn't going to be a comprehensive overlook of the research I've done, but rather give you a, a taste into the sort of challenges we face in, in, in clinical in education, a little bit of the work that I, I've done together with um, my supervisors here at Glasgow, and then what we hope to do with the PhD moving forward. So um, in the spirit of honesty, I am a GP, don't hurt me <laughs> by background. But the other reason why I'm being so open about my roles is that uh, the work that I've done today is qualitative. So in the spirit of reflexivity, it's important that you understand where I'm coming from th with this. So I'm a GP and I'm a newly qualified GP, which means I've just just come out of my training. I'm an academic fellow that works in GPPC and um, I'm a lecturer as well. I'm the lead for comm skills at the medical school. And in August, I'm gonna be starting my PhD, which is really exciting. So, oops. Right, so what is our goal with these next 12 minutes? If you leave this room with a little idea of, I, you know, we need to do things differently. We need to rethink how we do things, then we've won. I've gotten, I've got where we need to go. And, and this is the premise with which I'm working with. We need to rethink about how we educate on complexity and multimorbidity or multiple long-term conditions in the clinical teaching environment. So this is what we're going to talk about for the next little bit. And I'm going to do that by starting by talking about the background. Why is it important? Why should we care? And then I'm going to give you some insight into our students' voices. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about what's next. So what do we know? about the future Scottish population. Now I'm preaching to the choir here. The majority of you are students or active researchers. So you know, we have an aging population. We have an, uh, inc there are gonna be increased numbers of long-term conditions. There's gonna be more multimorbidity, polypharmacy. And if we don't change the way we work or the way we do things, there are going to be worsening health inequalities. So that's the patient population, right? So what I'm going to do now is take a step back and I'm going to tell you a bit about what it's like being a clinician in that population. And this is what it feels like. Does anyone know what that image is of? What's it called? <laughs> 
Yeah, la tomatina for five euros. You can throw tomatoes at each other. It's pretty fun, I've heard. I haven't been, but I've given this lecture to a bunch of clinical educators, and I met a few people who've gone, and they said it's good fun. This is what it looks like, the polypharmacy, the multimorbidity, the uncertainty. It feels like chaos, right? Tomatoes flying everywhere. People come in. And what do we know is that humans are complex beings. You as an individual are a complex person. So it's important that I frame it this way because often the word complexity is associated with difficulty and oh, that's hard. And, but there's something beautiful about complexity. So this is what it's like for clinician, clinicians. When I show a group of clinical educators, this is what GP practice feels like as a clinician. They go, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But what do we do in medical school? How do we prepare students for becoming doctors. And this is what it's like. We actually teach them with individual tomatoes. So you could say, oh, this is your cardiovascular bunch of tomatoes. And here's your myocardial infarction there. And um, oh, let's talk a little bit about heart failure there. So we teach in boxes. And I've just said that people don't come in boxes. So we teach the curricula is built around single disease frameworks. Our clinical guidelines, when you go into hospital and somebody looks up a glide guideline, it is single disease based. And guess what? We assess via single diseases. So it was this experience, my experience of going through this process where it was really difficult. It made me question, how are we preparing the future generation of clinicians to deal with a whole person? There's so much work happening in the School of Health and Wellbeing around um, carers and you know, predictive models and reducing health inequalities. And there's a lot of research out there. And I'm always interested in how do we get the clinician to adopt that? And when I looked at what we were preparing them with, I'm like, are we equipping them to provide the best care that they can for our patients with multiple long-term conditions, psychosocial um, complexity and, and, and various circumstances? And this is what it feels like to them. And I'm not sure whether some of you can relate classroom versus the real world, but in the classroom, we say, okay, this person comes in with these classical symptoms. What do you need to consider? What treatment do you need to give? Correct. That's the first answer, correct. And, and so we, we get them obsessed with these single, single best answers and they leave thinking that there's an answer to everything. But real life is more complex than that. I wish that was what my GP practice was like. People would come in with one thing and I'd go, here's your prescription, off you go. tally -ho. You know, it's, it's messy. There's a lot of stuff that we need to consider. Right? So this is where I'm working from. And that's what led to this study. So this was part of my master's dissertation that I did with the University of Dundee, um, together with colleagues from Aberdeen and Glasgow. And it was about exploring medical students' experiences with complex patients. And it was a qualitative study using reflexive thematic analysis. And what we did was we got focus groups from Aberdeen, so senior medical students from Aberdeen and senior medical students from Glasgow. And we asked them, we said, well, what do you consider to be complex? What have you learned when you've been out on the wards, you know, shadowing um, consultants or in a GP practice? What were those experiences like for you? Because when I looked at the research, there wasn't much out there. Again, a lot of single disease based stuff, but also siloing patient populations. So there was a lot of literature on, for example, the prison population or dealing with patients who don't speak English as a first language, but no one really looking at how do we really deal with the messiness, which is real life and real people. Now, what I'm going to do is tell you about the key findings. So I'm gonna skip the sort of, I know you, as researchers, you're like, what? Um, but that's what the paper is for. So it's under review, so hopefully it'll be out. But I'm gonna skip to that and tell you what the key findings were. And this is what we found, was that this, this idea we had, which is what, what we saw when we looked at the single disease model, the students were entirely aware about. They were entirely aware of the fact that in the classroom, they were being told about specific cases, but when they went out to see patients, they didn't fit those cases. And they were also aware of the fact that that 
first day when they start working as a doctor, so they graduate and they end up on the wards. I'm not here to scare you, by the way. Um, they end up on the wards. Sometimes it's the first time that they've dealt with uncurated complexity. The first time they've actually been given free reign to deal with a whole person. And they were aware of this. And I think this is, this is a long quote, but I think it really uh, describes what students feel like. And I'm gonna read it out loud, actually. I know it's a faux pas to do with qualitative stuff, but I think you need to hear it. So I think it feels overwhelming because in medical school, you're told like a patient comes in with these classical symptoms. Then you go to clerk someone in, so that's take a history, speak to them. And you start thinking about one aspect, but then you have other bits and then it just adds more and more and more to it. And then you just get to a point where there's just so much there. And I'm used to dealing with everything in bite-sized chunks rather than combining a lot of things together. We've not had a huge amount of practice on that because when we do learn, we learn everything in isolation, but real patients aren't like that. And this was the other key finding from our work was that students actually felt shielded from complexity by their supervisors. So the way it works in medical school that you're typically attached to a clinical unit. So you could be attached to a GP surgery or you could be on the cardiology ward and you have a clinical supervisor, so someone who's looking after you, and typically they will direct you in your learning. They'll say, go and speak to this patient, take a history, go and do this. So you're sort of supported to be out in the real world. But what the students came up with and what was interesting was that Glasgow versus Aberdeen, which had very different clinical placements, we know what Glasgow's like, Aberdeen is more rural, they were saying the same thing, which is what tutors would direct them away from complexity. Because they like, oh, you don't, you need to know, you need to start with the basics. And also you're not gonna have that in your exam, which is important, don't get me wrong. Scaffolding, which means generally introducing concepts is essential, but there's still this big gap <laughs> once they finish their final exams. And it, the students didn't just um, comment on the fact that they were shielded. They also noted that just because someone's a qualified doctor doesn't necessarily mean they're qualified to teach you on complexity. And it's so this qualitative work that has actually formed the basis of the PhD project that's being funded by Wellcome as part of the multimorbidity PhD program. And these are the things I wanted to share with you, which is that we need to move beyond single disease frameworks in how we teach, in our guidelines, um, and importantly, how we assess. We need education that is research informed, and there is a lack of educational resources to help fuel, to help empower clinicians to educate the next generation on how to deal with multiple long-term conditions. And my determination to be part of the solution is why I'm doing this PhD project. And the PhD that I'm doing is a starting point for that. So going back, what are we doing for time? Not bad. Um, we really need to rethink about how we educate on complexity and multimorbidity in the clinical teaching environment. And I'm hoping that the PhD will be the start of how we figure that out. If anyone is interested in this work or thinks that they have some interesting work that they could share in relation to this, then please feel free to contact me. Thank you for paying attention. And that's the last talk of the seminar. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? I won't comment on your condition, like that only happens. Any questions? Yes, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm a GP too, uh, and I also teach medical students in their own practice. <clears throat> but one of the things I find most difficult is time. Mm -hmm. And trying to be able to have the time to teach, not just teach, but actually teach the complexity bit, because mm -hmm. the students quite often come in year four or five to me, which is like a, later on, and they, <clears throat> And they, they quite often are taught to ask questions about the, the actual presentation and then do the review of systems mm -hmm. and that opens up that can of worms and you end up, you know, you know, way down a sort of route where, where you're where you don't want to go. And I suppose it's about 
thinking how how can we have time to do that mm. and I'm really glad you actually brought up your experience as a tutor because like from a research reflective point of view I would have loved to be able to tri triangulate by getting the educator's voice as well didn't have the money didn't have the time so it was just looking at it from the learner's point of view but there are tensions on the opposite side which is that we are dealing with la tomatina so the you're sifting through all the clinical work in addition to educating on it. So what I'm hoping to do with the PhD is to get some insight into that so that whatever we propose is conscious of the environment that it needs to work in, which is the clinical learning environment. And that's the important thing, clinical, which means you still need to keep the patient alive in the meantime. So thank you for that, Julie. There was a question at the back? Yeah, um, I don't care. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, very good to send direction about how to make the time for the sort like it was more about instruments given that hand, maybe thinking some technological um developments might make easier to diagnose a specific thing than if you teach them quest to equip connect them and dots and save them time with like a screening sort of like, mm -hmm. like that. Um yeah I guess the question is kind of how you would give an idea what kind of yeah, so so I'm in the process of thinking about what is the best tool, and it, it kind of aligns, like you're saying, with what Julie is saying, because I'm not going to create more time for GPs. That's out with my control. And something you, you brought up, something inter interesting, which was technology using to diagnose. Now, AI and its use in clinical medicine, boy, is that a big, a big topic. Um, but yeah, technology could be one one aspect that could be explored. From the work that I had done, what I had actually found was a lot of the work that we do in the School on Health and Wellbeing, it, 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 it includes patient and public involvement, right? The work just goes right back to the patient. So what I'm interested to do with the PhD is explore with these various tensions. You've got the patient here who has their needs, which is, I want to be listened to, I want to be acknowledged. I want there to be consideration of the fact that I am an expert in my condition. I also want to understand what's going on here. So from a patient point of view, there are lots of demands. On the opposite side, you have a clinician who is not only trying to take into consideration everything the patient is saying and responding to it, but also trying to make a diagnosis and weigh that in the context of uncertainty. Because I just said there are single disease frameworks, right? Which means we don't have the research or data to help with multimorbidity clinical decision making. And on top of that, they have to facilitate learning for the, for the student that's with them and do so in a way that's beneficial to them and, and, and helps them develop the school skills and tools that they need to be a doctor. And so I think the answer with the PhD is actually introducing something that is simple rather than a complex solution and bringing it back to the patient. How that's going to be done is left to be decided. So if anyone online has any ideas, <laughs> I'm open to them. But there is, the plan is to, the arc of the PhD is to finish with an educational tool. What that tool looks like will be determined by the first stages, but I'm hoping to create something that will help facilitate discussions that include the patient's experiences, but also the, what it's like as a clinician dealing with all of that. Yes? At the moment. So the, the answer is, is that a lot of it happens in what we call the hidden curriculum. So if you looked at our curriculum, the black and white stuff in the medical school, nowhere is there like you must learn on complexity. No. What happens is students typically learn about complexity by shadowing doctors and their experience is then dependent on the tutor that they have. So they might be with some really confident, enthusiastic GP that loves complexity and is at ease with dealing with uncertainty and things like that or they might be with somebody who completely dismisses it. So the box standard is, is that it happens in the space that we call the hidden curriculum, which is that 
And they learn almost through osmosis, through facilitated discussions with their senior colleagues. And when they go out into the real world and they're in a training program, that is how they develop their skills in dealing with complexity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's a problem, right? <laughs> yes. I think I was going to say something similar to that. I'm a GP myself when I was trained in Malawi which is a low resource um, country that has quite a huge ratio between doctor to patient in terms of ratios. You see a lot mm -hmm. of patients and a lot of interactions. So as a student, I was um, I, I had interactions with um, patients as early as the, my third year, so for three years, and then one and a half years after, there was a lot of interactions between us and the patients. And as you're saying, a lot of the learning is informal in the sense that you are shadowing the, the consultant or you know your senior and you're learning how to deal with complex situations based on the, their decision making what they've asked you to go and read up the next and then represent the next day and i wonder whether dealing with complexity is as easier with when you have had a lot more ex um, hands-on experience with yeah. the patient. Yeah. Um, and whether now you're starting to embrace the skill of clinical judgment mm -hmm. and also knowing where to find the right resources. Mm -hmm. Because I, I would like to think um, different cases would have different combinations of diseases that you're mm -hmm. having to deal with so that it would be difficult to come up with a curriculum that says, for disease A and disease B, with in within this age, with this kind of ethnicity, with this kind of background, do A, B, C, D. It would, the clinical guidelines would be very long mm -hmm. and extensive in terms of amounts. And I wonder whether things like exchange programs, where if the gap is in exposure to patients, mm -hmm. and maybe certain students could go through certain parts of the countries where um, the, the curriculum allows for more interaction with patients mm -hmm. and the means to learn certain complexities in dealing with certain health issues. Yeah, and you've brought up, like, th thank you for sharing that, by the way. I really appreciate that. And, and it's great to see another GP. I thought we would be <laughs> just, uh, just the three of us. But I think you, you bring up a lot of interesting points there, which is that we do want the students to engage more with the patients. And it's not to say that the complexity isn't there, but rather that they're not being facilitated or supported to learn from the patient in front of them because their consultant would be like, oh no, we've got, we've got to like hurry on now. Or what, what I found when I spoke to tutors in an informal fashion. So I, I presented my work at the clinical tutors conference at UCL, Dundee, Aberdeen, and Glasgow. So big groups of GP educators. And they often talk about the fact that from a clinic clinical point of view, they know what to do, but they feel a bit funny. Like if you have students, don't you? If you're an expert in a thing, it doesn't mean you can actually teach or educate around that thing. Like it's a different skill entirely. And so they have, they feel insecure about how they manage that. I'm mindful of time, um, but this was so fascinating. Thank you for your comments. Um, I don't know if Claire wants to say anything else. <laughs> Yeah. And we've got another seminar planned for the 7th of May, so pop it in your diaries. Great. Thank you. Thank you.